Good morning. My name is Ashley Brunko, and I am a staff attorney in the Immigrant and Survivor Justice Department at the Neighborhood Christian Legal Clinic. Uh, welcome to yet another installment of Coffee with the Clinic, a new series of online videos uh, where attorneys from our department will discuss various immigration law and survivor justice related topics. Uh, these videos are scheduled to take place on the second Tuesday of every month at 11 o'clock here on Facebook. Uh, the scheduled topic for each week will be posted in advance, um, but we're also open to hearing any topic suggestions. So if you have any, please feel free to relay them to us. Uh, we'll also be translating these videos into Spanish. So keep an eye on social media and specifically Facebook uh, for when the Spanish version of today's video is posted. So in today's discussion, we're going to be talking about humanitarian parole and particularly um, the process as it relates to the situation taking place in Ukraine. Uh, so first, as a general disclaimer, this presentation is intended as a public legal education workshop for general information and should not be construed as legal advice. Immigration cases are complex, they're fact specific, and the law is frequently changing. So we strongly recommend that if you believe you have a case that you would like to pursue, uh, that you speak with an attorney in your area to discuss your case. So what is humanitarian parole? Uh, as the name would suggest, it is a method for entry into the U.S. without a U visa that is available to those in humanitarian situations. So specifically emergency related circumstances. Uh, historically, because it applies to such limited uh, circumstances, it has not been used all that frequently. So before we jump into the specifics of how humanitarian parole is being utilized uh, to assist Ukrainians, I'm going to walk you through uh, what the standard humanitarian parole process looks like. So step one is the application phase. There are two forms that you'll need to file, a Form I-131 application for travel documents and a Form I-134 affidavit of support. There is a $575 filing fee that needs to be mailed to USCIS. Um, if you believe that your financial circumstances may warrant a fee waiver, you can also file what is called a Form I-912. There are very specific circumstances that form refers to, uh, which could be the subject of another video. Um, the documents that must be supplied in support of those forms that I just mentioned differ based on whether you're the petitioner or whether you are the beneficiary. So if you are the petitioner, in support of the forms, you must file uh, with your application some identity documents and um, preferably evidence of your immigration status in the U.S. While that is not required, uh, it may aid in your application to submit proof that you are a lawful permanent resident or a U.S. citizen. The identity documents um, can include things like the biographic page of your passport or a government issued driver's license. In addition, you will also need to uh, submit proof that you are able to financially support uh, the beneficiary during the duration of their stay in the United States. So to establish that, you would submit the forms like a copy of your most recent federal taxes, um, your IRS tax transcript, evidence of current employment, or financial records. If you are the beneficiary, the documents that you will need to submit include a description of the urgent humanitarian or specific public benefit reason that you are submitting a humanitarian parole application, uh, a statement explaining why you are unable to attain a U visa, or excuse me, uh, whether why you are unable to obtain a visa, and if you have any grounds of inadmissibility, a request for a waiver of those grounds. If you've previously filed any immigrant or non-immigrant applications with USCIS or any other body, you would also need to submit a copy of any final decision on those applications uh, with the forms. Uh, humanitarian parole is not intended to be a method of circumventing the traditional visa process. So some of these requirements that I've touched on can be enforced quite strictly to ensure that um, that circumventing isn't taking place. So some examples of circumstances in which uh, you might request humanitarian parole can include uh, you're coming to the United States requesting medical treatment or an organ donation. 
uh, you're caring for a seriously or terminally ill relative that is in the US, uh, if you're requesting to reunify with family that is in the US because that family member has a particular vulnerability. Um, some other reasons might include that you're attending a US-based family member's funeral or handling a deceased family member's estate. And finally, and this is most specific to the Ukrainian situation, uh, you are seeking protection from targeted or individualized harm when the typical refugee or resettlement process is unavailable to you. So once you have done everything in step one and your application has been approved, we move into step two. Uh, the first thing that you'll need to do is file form DS-160 in order to consular process. Uh, you'll be scheduled an interview at your local consulate, and if a positive determination is made uh, following that interview, you will be issued a travel document that authorizes your entry into the U.S. Typically, uh, you're only approved to enter the U.S. within a short window of time, so about 30 days. So it's important to have your travel arrangements made prior to that, uh, that interview. Then we've entered the US, typically you're able to remain for a period of one to two. And at the expiration of your stay, you can either renew. If you're aware of an alternative pathway to gaining status in the US, you could file that application um, or you can return to your home country. So with the recent crises that have taken place in Afghanistan and the Ukraine, the U.S. has put in place new processes for people in those specific countries. Uh, today, we're going to focus on the Ukraine process as it is the most recently instituted and builds and expands upon the program uh, that was previously created for Afghans. So the program uh, for Ukrainians is called Uniting for Ukraine Parole. And under the program, the principal beneficiary must be a displaced citizen of Ukraine. The U.S.-based sponsor is able to file an electronic I-134 form. There are no fees required, and a fee reimbursement may be available to you if you had previously filed an I-131 under the process we had discussed on the prior slides. Uh, this program notably does not require an interview or for the applicant to consular process. And this is a significant development because um, as a lot of Afghans were experiencing during times of turmoil in their country, it was really difficult to find a consulate and get an interview scheduled. So that is one positive change that's been uh, made in the process for Ukrainians. Additionally, the applicant is only required to make a medical and vaccination attestation as opposed to submitting to a medical exam. And finally, the program creates a principal uh, slash derivative application processing structure. So what this means is that the beneficiary can have derivative family members who gain parole and entry into the US solely based on the relationship to the principal beneficiary. Uh, so, excuse me. So in the process, my phone is ringing. I'm sorry if you're all able to hear this. I am not able to stop my phone from ringing. Oh, the glories of technology. Um, let's see. All right, getting back to it. So the process for Ukrainians is as follows. Uh, step one, the supporter will file the form I-134, like I discussed online, with the documents demonstrating their ability to financially support the beneficiary for the duration of their stay in the US. Uh, step two, if an unfavorable determination is made, so it is decided that they do not have the ability to financially support the petitioner, or excuse me, the beneficiary, they are able to actually file that application again and switch supporters. Uh, if a favorable determination is made, the principal beneficiary is invited to create a MyUSCIS account, and they will then be able to uh, complete their application for themselves and their derivatives on that online portal. Finally, uh, after submission of that online application, if a favorable decision is made, all beneficiaries receive electronic travel documents. The beneficiaries then in step four would travel to the US and undergo inspection by CPB within 90 days. And then upon entry to the US, they must attest to receiving a medical screening for tuberculosis within 90 days. 
Uh, notably, this is an increase in time from the prior requirement. So I've mentioned the terminology of being a supporter, uh, but what does that actually mean and how can you qualify? So anyone with lawful status in the US can be a supporter. Uh, in the standard humanitarian parole process, the sponsor doesn't need to have a particular immigration status, uh, but it is easier to prove that you have the financial means to support um, the beneficiary if you are a lawful permanent resident or a US citizen. People eligible, uh, you know, that, that fall under that category of having lawful status in the US uh, would be non-immigrants uh, in lawful status. So think of someone with an approved U visa application, uh, parolees, TPS holders, uh, beneficiaries of deferred action, including DACA or deferred enforcement departure. You must pass security and background vetting. And like we had talked about previously, you must be able to demonstrate sufficient financial resources to receive, maintain, and support the beneficiary during their stay in the US. An organization is not able to serve in name as a sponsor, or excuse me, as a supporter, but if the organization is providing a personal individual with the means to support um, a beneficiary, that information can be provided in your financial attestations and will be considered uh, when determining your ability to financially support. So then who can be a beneficiary? The list includes residents in Ukraine as of February 11th, 2022, uh, and if you, if you were displaced as a result of the Russian invasion. Uh, Ukrainian citizens that have been present in the US at that time may be eligible for temporary protected status instead of pursuing uh, this Ukrainian program. So to be a principal beneficiary, you must be a Ukrainian citizen with a valid passport. If you are not a Ukrainian citizen, the beneficiary must be an immediate family member of someone who is. So that would be a, a common law partner of Ukrainian citizen and or their unmar unmarried children under the age of 21. It's important to know that the child is When you enter the United States, they must be accompanied by a parent or legal guardian. They are unable uh, to enter the US unaccompanied. Uh, some of the additional requirements are that you, like I said, must be outside of the U.S., which is why there are different rules in place for Ukrainians that are inside the U.S. as of the time of the um, invasion by Russia. And you must be able to pass biometric, or excuse me, biographic and biometric security checks. So some important things to note about entering the U.S. and remaining after um, under this program is that the US government is not providing assistance with arranging or funding travel. Upon entry, you are able to apply for a work and request a social security number. The form that you would fill for as an I-7 not gain access to settlement benefits um, unless at a later date Congress were to authorize that, but as things stand currently, you do not. Um, you must notify USCIS of any changes to your address, and your parole terminates automatically on either the expiration of your authorized stay um, or if you leave the US without being given advanced authorization to travel. Cool. DHS can also, uh, DHS is in the Department of Homeland Security, US law. the authorized period that you are referred to removal proceedings before an immigration judge. So on this slide, I have listed some hand, uh, helpful resources if you would like to learn more about the Uniting for Ukraine Parole Program. Uh, note that the clinic's website is listed at the bottom of, uh, while we handle a variety of immigration case types, we are only in at this department is not fully open for intakes, but if and get joined an intake, uh, will be available on our website. Some time constraints, we will get back to those by replying to your questions in the comments as appearing this live.
that is all for me today. So thank you for tuning into today's session on humanitarian parole. If you're interested, our next video will take place on Tuesday, September 13th here on Facebook at 11 o'clock. And we will cover the topic of bona fide determinations in new visa cases. Uh, remember to follow us on any of our social media platforms and check uh, back in with Coffee with the Clinic uh, in our schedule so you can calendar topics that you may be interested in listening to. We'll see you next month on the second Tuesday. Thank you.